Hey everybody, it's Sauce and it's that time of year again. Shoulder season is wrapping up and I'm pretty sure I've gone on my last overnight of the season, which means it's time for my 2023 backpacking gear review. I'm doing it a little bit differently this year and releasing multiple videos based on my different gear categories. So if you haven't already, be sure to subscribe so you get my reviews of my entire gear list. As always, I want to start this out with a reminder that the gear you already have is almost always best as long as it's going to keep you safe, in good enough shape, you know, to function as it's supposed to. And I don't want to encourage you to buy anything you don't need, but if you're in the market for anything, if something needs replacement or you're just starting to build up your backpacking gear list, or if you're just curious about what I carry, then this backpacking gear review is for you. I did have quite a bit of gear that was ready to be replaced after the CDT last year. And while I still totally love all of the gear that I carried and still stand by all the reviews that I gave at the end of last year, I did take this as an opportunity to change up a few things. So you actually will see quite a few different items than what I carried in 2022. Specifically, my focus this year has been trying to go smaller and lighter without sacrificing too much comfort. And so you'll see that reflected in a lot of my gear updates. To give you an idea of what I use this gear for, I did a couple of different off trail routes this year. I did some desert hiking and I did a lot of high alpine stuff in Colorado. Total, I probably backpacked around 200 miles this year, which obviously is quite a bit lower than in 2022, but I think it still is a good amount of mileage in varied enough conditions to form some solid opinions on the gear that I carried. Make sure you stick around to the end of this video for some of my favorite and longest lasting backpacking essentials. Another quick side note, some of this gear was gifted to me in exchange for work, like a social post or taking photos of the gear. Um, in all of those instances, I did reach out to the company to see if they would be willing to do something like that with me because I was already interested in the gear, um, but just wanted to put that out there for full transparency's sake. This first video of the series, I'll be going over the basics, which includes my pack, sleep setup, and a few extras that I always Always carry. So with that, let's get started with one of my most exciting additions, my Neighborhood Packs 30 liter Meadowlark backpack. On the CDT, I would dream of being what I like to call a tiny pack queen, and the team at Neighborhood Packs has made my tiny purple pack dreams come true. This pack is super sturdy. I can't tell you how many rock walls I scraped this against on my various routes this summer, and it still looks like brand new, like there's no crazy scuffing or anything. Oh, all the seams are still intact. It carries really comfortably and it compresses all of my gear really nicely, which is something I was definitely looking for in a smaller pack. I wanted um, something that would feel very compact so that while I was scrambling and stuff on these off trail routes, I wouldn't feel like my pack was in the way. It is frameless with a removable hip belt for all of the hardcore ultra lighters. This comes off right here with this little clasp. I was glad to have the help belt for some of my trips with longer water carries like in the Grand Canyon, but I did start experiment with removing it and I've also really enjoyed kind of having that freedom of not having a hip belt. As someone who is guilty of completely overstuffing my mesh and basically shoving anything in there that will fit, I do like that this mesh is a little bit more confining. It doesn't stretch quite as much as some other meshes, which honestly keeps me from overstuffing it. Other people might feel differently about that, but I like it because it means I don't overpack. I also like that the fact that it has three pockets because it's a little bit easier to organize things. Like I don't just bury stuff in the very bottom of the mesh pocket like I do with like a one front mesh pocket. I can put things that I need to grab quickly through the side right here. I usually keep my trash in this bottom mesh pocket or my ground sheet. And then this pocket doesn't get become like a bottomless black hole, which is really nice. This pack is also made of waterproof fabric and it is seam taped. They don't qualify it as waterproof because I believe there's like a bunch of extra testing you have to go through for that and it would have to be submersible. But the point is like, you don't really need to worry about this pack in the rain, which I really appreciate with the afternoon storms in Colorado. I do still put a pack liner in there, but I have a ton of peace of mind knowing that this pack isn't even gonna leak at the seams, which is really nice. The only thing that I did not use this pack for this summer was the Fifner Traverse because obviously 30 liters is kind of small and knowing that we were gonna be out for seven days with a bear can, it just didn't seem practical at all. So I did use my Superior Wilderness Designs on that hike and like I said, still of that pack, but really was excited to move on to a smaller pack that would be a little bit more compact for different adventures. Another thing that I love about this pack is the webbing on the shoulder straps here, because as you can see, my Peak Designs clip is on there right now that I use to carry my camera. And it's really nice because it 
sits above that foam. Um, so I don't have to worry about that clip like pushing into my shoulder like I have with other packs. Sometimes it goes around the entire strap. There's an ice axe loop on this pack. Another cool feature is these straps here. You can put a sleeping pad there or if you're wanting to move to a 30 liter pack, but you're not quite downsized enough in your gear list, you can maybe put a tent here or something. Have the classic elastic bands here that you can use to um, like dry your gear. Like if you have wet socks or something, you can keep it on the outside. I also really love like these little straps for that reason. Um, this is nice if you wanna put your trekking poles in your pack, you can like strap them in so they're not like flailing around um, outside of the water bottle pocket or also use this to dry some gear as well. I believe they are making some updates to this design. Like now you have the option to have the side compression straps for the top rather than the closure, um, the like middle classic closure, which I think is really nice. It gives you just like a tiny bit of extra room rather than having to like compress that when you're closing it. You can just kind of like fold it down like that. So overall, really love this pack. I also love supporting small family owned businesses in Colorado. Neighborhood Packs is based out of Colorado Springs and they're just really lovely to work with. They even gave me a discount code for y'all. So if you're interested in getting your own Neighborhood Packs, it's Saucy10, S-A-U-C-E-Y 10 for 10% off. Obviously this pack is smaller and frameless, so it isn't really for someone who has a heavier backpacking load or hasn't downsized their gear quite yet. I wouldn't recommend this if you're currently using like a 60 liter pack and filling it up, but overall if you're looking to downsize, I am honestly obsessed with this pack and can't recommend it enough. Moving on to my new backpacking quilts the Catabatic Sawatch 15 Degree. I've been eyeing a Catabatic quilt for years and since it was finally time to retire my Z-Packs bag, I could not wait to get my hands on one of these. If you've watched any of my other videos or any of my other gear reviews, you've probably picked up on the fact that I do get cold super easily. And so I went with the 15 degree option from Catabatic, the warmest that they offer. And I have been super, super happy with that decision. I also went with the Elite Series since it has a permanently closed foot box, you can see like it doesn't zip close, it's just like all sewn together. And I just don't think I'm ready for a quilt that opens up all the way yet, personally. Or honestly, if I ever will be. Maybe um, if I get to try one out, I'll see if I like it. But personally, I like my feet being nice and um, swaddled, basically. <laughs> The 15 degree is probably overkill for most people as a summer bag, but since I'm backpacking a lot in the high alpine of Colorado and I do get cold very easily, it's honestly perfect for me and it's the most versatile like shoulder season bag as well. I personally don't buy like both a shoulder season bag and a summer bag. Um, maybe one day when I'm rich, you'll see me. That's how you'll know. That's how you know I won the lottery or something is if I start having like multiple sleeping bags to switch out for multiple different seasons. But the 15 degrees honestly been versatile enough for me, especially like you can air it out if you need to. Some specific features of this quilt that I really love are the extra down in the foot box. My feet always seem to be the coldest part of me when I'm sleeping. And so that extra fill they put in here is really a game changer for me. And it is noticeable. Like you can tell that it's nice and toasty down there. Another thing that I really like about this quilt is the pad attachment system. It seems to just work super well. I have videos on their site that I definitely recommend watching before you take this quilt out if you have it. But these little clips basically fasten onto a string that goes around your sleeping pad and once you fasten it properly, it just does not move at all. I don't get any drafts. And that was like one of the things that I was most nervous about with a quilt, not being able to zip myself in, but honestly having that attachment system is just as good as having a zipper in my opinion. But again, definitely recommend watching that video because these are a little bit tricky to put on at first. You don't wanna make sure you're confident in how you're attaching it. Otherwise you might feel like you are gonna break them or something because they're pretty stiff when you first get the bag. Another thing I really like about this bag is the designated phone pocket. I also use this a lot for my water filter to make sure it doesn't freeze overnight. And I don't think I realized what I was missing before when I didn't have like a designated place for it. Like obviously you can just toss it in your bag and have it down by your feet or whatever. But honestly, it's kind of nice to just have like a pocket that you can always stick it in, keeps it from moving around while you're sleeping. And same thing goes for your phone. It's just nice to have a space to keep that warm. Another thing that I really like about this bag is the button collar. I like how it is a little bit narrower than your shoulders and you can just snap this shut and make yourself really like closed in and it's super cozy and it's like nice and snug without a ton of extra weight. And of course, if you are feeling too warm and you don't want those buttons on, you can just leave it open. 
Another thing I really love is how light for the warmth that this is. It's 26 ounces and that's a great weight for a truly warm down bag. Um, and it also compresses really well in my pack. Like I said, I updated to a 30 liter this year and I have no problem fitting this in with all my other stuff. Catabatic is also a local to me, Colorado company that has some awesome business practices. So I love being able to support them. Next up in big gear changes is my Nemo Tensor inflatable sleeping pad. I have officially given myself over to the full length blow up sleeping pad lifestyle. I resisted for as long as I could, but I'm done torturing myself on foam pads. I also think I'm honestly just getting older and the short pads and the foam pads just like aren't cutting it anymore after long days on trail. I considered a lot of different options for this. I ended up leaning on the Nemo Tensor ultimately because Josh, aka Kid, aka my fiance, had already tested out quite a few different blow up pads and on the CDT and he eventually ended up sticking with this one. And so I kind of went with the experiences I went saw him go through. And so far this has been a really great pad for both of us. I also used his a lot, borrowed his a lot um, before I purchased my own and I'm very, happy with this decision so far. It is 15 ounces, which is two ounces heavier than the Thermarest that's the same size, but I was also able to get it for about half the price. I have seen it on sale quite a few times, so um, maybe if you're lucky, you'll be able to snag it for a good price as well. It has an R value of 4.2, which makes it great for using into shoulder season as well as high altitudes in summer. So I like that my sleep system is pretty warm. Again, I'm very cold all the time, so I don't really have to worry about changing things out too much when it gets colder because it's pretty sufficient for at least shoulder season. The valve for blowing this up can be a little bit tricky the first few times you use it. It's got a double layer to keep the air in as you're blowing it up. So you actually blow into this valve um, while you're blowing it up and that stays in there and then you close it with this valve once you're done. If you need to add more air once it's been sitting for a little bit, like if it's really cold out um, and it deflates a little bit once you initially blow it up, that's the part where it gets tricky because sometimes you just gotta be careful when you pull off this outside layer that you're holding down on that inner layer so you don't pull both out and end up deflating a lot more than you intended. I also have started to always carry the inflation bag for blowing this up. You just attach it to the valve with this part here and then you put air in here, kind of like scoop it or you can blow into it a little bit like from a distance and then you fold this down and then that fills up the bag a lot faster and a lot more easily than having to do it with your own breath. I also had one of our sleeping pads end up really moldy. Um, it's about 10 years old, so honestly, not that big of a deal, but after seeing that mold kind of emerge from the inside of the sleeping pad, I wanted to avoid that at all costs with the rest of my gear. So in the name of longevity for gear, I definitely recommend carrying a blow up bag as well if your sleeping pad comes with them. The biggest risk with inflatable pads is obviously that they can pop, but I do a few different things to help mitigate this, which I'll get into later. I'm happy with this pad so far and will definitely continue to use it next season. While I did finally upgrade to a blow up pad, I wasn't completely ready to give up the foam pad nap in the middle of the day lifestyle that I've grown accustomed to. So I was looking for something lighter than a typical like Zlite or similar model to that because I couldn't just keep justifying the extra 10 to 12 ounces and carrying two sleeping pads. And that's where I landed on the Gossamer Gear Thin Light Foam Pad. It's just 2.7 ounces and you could even cut it to make it shorter if you wanted. I kind of like having the length because like I said, it helps mitigate any potential holes in my sleeping pad. So I put this underneath my sleeping pad at night as well to kind of give it an extra layer of protection. And it really fills the gap that my old foam pad left behind as far as having something to sit or lay on in the middle of the day. Obviously this is a bit thinner, so you have to be a bit pickier with your nap spot choices, but overall I'm really happy with it. One thing to note with this pad is if you do lay on it during the day, just be sure to inspect it before you put it under your other sleeping pad at night because it does tend to pick up like little leaves and like pokey things. So um, make sure you like run your hand over it and pick out anything that it might've picked up during the day so you're not inadvertently making it more likely that you're gonna pop your foam pad. Another huge upgrade I made this year was to my tent. I have had my eye on a Durston tent 
for again quite a while and I just couldn't justify buying another tent until my old one bit the dust but after 5,000 miles my duplex finally called it quits and I was excited to try something new. So obviously I am still a fan of DCF tents. I think tents are one of the items that actually do make the most sense to be made out of DCF and you can save honestly a lot of weight this way. That's why I went with the X-Mid Pro. The tent itself is 16.4 ounces but with the stuff sack and stakes it's just over 19 ounces. I also did go with a one person tent this time to save weight. While the duplex had a palatial amount of space for one person, I don't feel like I'm actually sacrificing that much by switching to the X-Mid Pro one. Obviously it's not as big, but it's still plenty of space for one person and I didn't need all of that extra room. There's still a lot of room inside for all of my things and the vestibules offer a ton of extra space for any gear that you wanna keep outside of the tent. In the vestibules, but um, not in like the actual footprint space. One of the biggest complaints obviously about single wall tents is always the condensation, which I think the X-Mid has some really unique and cool solves for. Because of the unique design of the X-Mid, there is quite a bit of space to sit up inside of the tent without touching the walls. You can avoid getting condensation on you that way, um, but they also added these little vents that prop open with Velcro at the top corners of the tent. So even if you have both of the storm doors closed, you can still get airflow in the tent that way. I also really like the little internal pockets on this tent. I did not realize what I was missing when I didn't have them and I don't think I could go back now. It's a great spot to like stick just a few items every night that you don't wanna like roll into or roll around on, like my glasses um, fit in there really nicely. And it's nice to just have those pockets that are kind of up on the wall. Another really sweet and thoughtful feature on this tent is the little magnets that help to hold the vestibule doors open when you have the tent set up. It's honestly really convenient and you don't have to deal with little like pulleys or anything like that. There's also these little elastic ties that can keep the mesh doors open if you're like kind of moving in and out while you're setting up your tent, which I also really appreciate. The X-Men is a little tricky to get the hang of pitching at first, so I highly recommend watching their videos, practicing at home before you take it out backpacking. It is a little bit of a learning curve, but as long as you pay attention to that, I think you'll get the hang of it. Another thing to note is the footprint is also pretty large, even on the one, just because of the vestibules being so big. So that can be a little bit tricky in certain campsites, especially if there's like a lot of roots and things. It was a little bit of a learning curve for me to try and figure out how to pitch it so that like my footprint, like the actual spot I was laying on um, and like the actual floor of the tent wasn't on a route because of the way that the vestibule was situated. And eventually you figure it out and the footprint itself, you can kind of maneuver as you set it up. There are a ton of really great thoughtful features that I think really set this tent apart from other similar tents on the market and I'm excited to keep using it next year. Next up as part of my backpacking essentials are my Black Diamond Alpine Carbon Cork Poles. If you've seen any of my videos, you've seen these poles, they've been with me since the PCT and have over 5,000 miles on them. It's probably time for another tip replacement. As a side note, I've replace the tips on these twice. I think if you don't know all trekking poles, most trekking poles should have replaceable tips. These ones definitely do. And that's a great way to give your trekking poles even more life and longevity. Obviously these have been extremely durable overall. I love them. I don't have anything I would change about them. And the cork handles, I think really do make a big difference for the durability. I see a lot of people with foam handles kind of wearing down pretty quickly. Whereas I feel like these last quite a bit longer. One thing that is getting a little bit difficult with these with age and I could probably fix with a screwdriver is the clasps sometimes um, are a little bit harder to open and close. But again, I think if I took the time to fix that, um, that's probably an easily fixable issue. Overall, I will keep these until one of them snaps, which looks like it won't happen for a while. The next item that is part of my essential setup is my ground sheet. I've started to use Tyvek. After using Polygirl for a while, I just couldn't justify anymore how quickly it started to rip and how often I had to replace it. So I have officially converted to Tyvek for now as my official ground sheet. The small size from Six Moon Designs is actually a little wide and short for the footprint of the X-Mid Pro one. So I trimmed the width and I'm okay with a few inches of tent floor on the ground. So it's just not quite long enough for the footprint. I just avoid sleeping on that part if I can, but if you have an X-Mid and you are wanting a Tyvek that fits underneath it, it might be worth getting a custom size, like going to the hardware store or something, or maybe buying a longer one somehow. Or you can also get a Durstin ground sheet, obviously. But yeah, overall, 
I've just been using this as is. We used the same Tyvek ground sheet for over 2,000 miles of the CDT, and this is this is it. This is the ground sheet, and it's still got some life left in it. So in terms of durability, I think it's a lot better than Polycro. And if the noise of Tyvek bothers you and you don't want to break it in, I've learned recently that you can stick it in the washer, and that will help sort of like break it in at first, so it's not making those super loud crinkly noises in case you roll into camp late or something. But yeah, big fan of the Tyvek ground sheet. Another essential that I bring on every trip with me now is my through pack fanny pack. As you can see, it has been well loved, but it's still working great. I do have the comfy strap on this. I haven't tried them without the comfy strap, but I do really like having that. And that's the only part that has a little bit of wear. You can see where it's like connected. It's starting to wear a little bit, but for as long as I've had this, I think that's honestly really impressive. What I really love about having a fanny pack is if I wanna drop my pack for something or like take a quick bathroom break, I can still have a few things like important things in here like navigation and maybe my inReach. It's also nice to be able to carry around in town if you're on a through hike. And it's also waterproof, which is great if you need a place to stick electronics in the rain. Like for example, sometimes I'll just shove my phone in there and zip it closed so I can still access it if I need it. It's not like all the way in my pack, but it's also staying dry in here. I like that it's not super bulky design and it's also still going strong after my CDT hike last year. So definitely recommend through pack if you were in the market for a fanny pack. Finally, as the last part of my essentials is my pack liner, which is literally just a trash compactor bag. I don't use a rain cover because as I mentioned, the metal arc is made out of waterproof material and so is my superior wilderness designs. But I do like having the pack liner just as a little bit of redundancy, just in case, you know, if I open my bag, need to get in there for something that's on the top or whatever, it doesn't like start getting everything inside my bag wet. If I do have to do something like swim at a water crossing, which hopefully never happens, or if I happen to fall in, then having that pack liner is like a nice extra peace of mind. You really don't want your sleeping bag getting wet, obviously. Um, so it's good to have some double protection there. I do like having the white compactor bag specifically because it's a little bit easier to see inside your bag. They do make black ones, but I feel like those are kind of harder to dig through. I have also heard of people using the compactor bag around their quilts on super cold nights um, as a little bit of extra insulation. If you do that, just be careful of condensation. It might end up getting you a little bit wet. Could be good in a pinch. And that is it for my backpacking basics. If you haven't already, please subscribe so you don't miss the rest of my backpacking gear reviews. And next up is going to be my clothes. Feel free to leave any questions you have in the comments and thanks so much for watching.